Hello world! <laughs> Welcome back to Source Decoded. I'm pleased to have someone here that we haven't seen for a long time. Well, I see him most every day, <laughs> but it's been hard for us to get together to do a video for a while because we've moved. Yep. And um, just kind of all sorts of life yep. has happened. And I have noticed in the comments of some of the videos that people miss these um, one on one, I don't know, what'd you call this? Dialogue, these, maybe? Dialogue that we do. Um, some people are rather annoyed by it, but some people <laughs> are more annoyed by me. I, and I've noticed that we do actually seem to get more um, traffic on the old videos where it's us in front of the whiteboard than some of the newer stuff that we've done. So, Which is sad because of some of our best videos is just you in the video. <laughs> so, we, we're going to have to remake that JavaScript is easy one yeah. sometime. Uh, because it stupidly remains one of our most popular. Come up with a better title. Yeah. We've got a catchy title. Just everything's JavaScript yeah. is easy and we'll get tons of traffic. Yeah, we should, we should do that. So, yeah, true to form, we're rambling. That's true. Um, but we, uh, we were just starting in on an interesting philosophical conversation. We were. And I decided we got the camera right here. So we just record it. We might as well just record it. So, so we start over? Yeah, go ahead and ask me the question that you had opened with. Okay, so can I, a little bit of background. Yeah, go ahead. So, like some of you know, I, I paint and I love to draw. And I was painting the other day with another good friend. And he's a deep thinker as well. And as we were traveling home, we were saying, how do we really know we're any better than anybody else? Like, how do we know that our paintings, and we look down at these other people, and like, look at, we're better than them. Like, are we sure we're better than them? Like, what if we're just delusional? Like, right. what if we're just, I know I'm, and maybe we're just arrogant. I don't know. Like, what, what makes, what makes art, some art better than other art? And then it made me think, today I was looking over some code that, that's at our work, and I, I was disappointed, and then I had the same thought come to me. It's like, am I disappointed because I'm delusional? Like, that I think that I have some better way of, of writing this, or solving this problem. And then I, I said, well, I know that good, what I value as good art is when the artist breaks down complexity in its simplest form. Right. And portrays his message in the simplest way. And it doesn't, it's not convoluted, it's not, it's not messy, it's just beautifully simple. Yeah. And... So that's how I guess I, I'm gauging art as what is good and what is not. Like if the art piece isn't cohesive and together and simple, then it's like mm -hmm. the, it's just nasty. So that was my so that was the question. Now I, I can't wait to hear the feedback. Yeah, this is an interesting question because like we have this YouTube channel and and uh, I think that I have something to tell the world about how to be good at programming. What what good programming is and like. I've asked myself this, am I qualified to Are have we a YouTube the world channel right? about, about how to code? And how do you know? Like, we talk about good code. We have right. books called Clean Code. We have... Um, patterns, we programming have patterns. patterns right? Right? How do you know that you're any good at what you're doing? What is good code? What makes yeah. code clean? Right. So we have a lot of words for um, messy code, like spaghetti. spaghetti. Uh -huh. So, like... How does, I guess, have you ever seen artwork that you could say is spaghetti art? I think, I think so, yeah. Like if it's not, for, for example, in some beginning artists, they scumble a lot. So the they, val they scumble. Scumble? I don't know if that's a word. That's a uh, that I'm, might be a word. I, I hope I'm it's just, a word. I was just assuming it's artist lingo. It, it might be. I'm not sure what would happen if you looked it up. But anyways... They, they they don't mix a paint and have every, for example, good artists are very deliberate with every brush stroke. They mix the paint, they look at what they're looking at, they see the shape, and then they lay it down. Uh -huh. uh, beginning artists, they, they don't know how to mix well, so they're afraid of mixing. So they'll just put the paint, and then they'll just kind of like push paint around, on, and so no form is being, there's no structure. And then they're pushing paint around instead of deliberately painting it in certain spots. So it's almost like they haven't broken it down. There's, it's... So spaghetti like I guess it's just no form. So so it's, it sounds like if you're if you're practiced at art, you can see what you're about to paint before you actually put the paint down, 
Yeah, you see things in its its essence. So like you break down the shadows, like good artists break down into a value system that's simplified, not a million different shades. They break it down to maybe nine shades. Uh -huh. And then they see those values in their subject, and then they place it down deliberately. Whereas the novice artists will think, oh, there's an infinite amount of values. And they'll go and they'll try to meet those infinite amount of values, and then you get muck. It's just... Mm -hmm. Mud. They call it mud, too, in art. And so I think that you have the same thing in programming. When you don't understand the problem well, you get spaghetti code. When you, don't, when you can't break down the subject in art, you get mud painting or spaghetti painting. <laughs> spaghetti art. Yeah, spaghetti art. I'll bet I could do spaghetti art. I bet I'd be really good at that. Or maybe abstract art like Pollock. I think he did spaghetti <laughs> art because it's uh, splashes and stuff. Now, that's an interesting point, too, because I have my idea of what good code is, I also have an idea of what good art is, uh -huh. and Jackson Pollock isn't on the list. Like, <laughs> I know who he is, but, like, just just the art, that, that would be spaghetti art to me. It doesn't doesn't mean anything to me. I, think, I can't right. see anything in it. There, there's no, no value to you in that, in his art, that you can, you gain from it, maybe. Yeah. That's, that's the other part that's hard for me to distinguish, because in art, there is subjectivity, right? Uh-huh. So, in different parts of art, uh, some art is considered great, some art is considered not great, mm -hmm. for different reasons. So I'm wondering, is there the same thing inside of code? Is there this, is spaghetti code accepted as right. good art? I've seen people justify spaghetti code, and, and valiantly, it's, it's easier to understand, than, and yeah. I can, it's linear, and, and it's sequential, and uh, yeah, so... And the is the the two thousand and K statement is beautiful because it's all there. Yeah, it's apparent. You can read it top to bottom, and it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So if I if I were to say what I thought novice a, a novice program looked like, I would say it's very imperative. You know, just kind of top to bottom without much abstraction, and. Uh, I mean, you, when you were talking about a novice artist just kind of pushing paint yeah, around... Yeah, they don't know what they're doing. It kind of sounds like they're looking for something. They, they know, kind of have a vague idea of what they're going for, but they don't know exactly what it is, so they're just kind of pushing the paint, saying, is that what I'm looking for? No, that's not quite. Is that what I'm looking for? You know, I think I, I would say they don't understand... The painters, the novice painters, don't understand what they're... They don't understand what they're looking at. So when you say what they're looking at, like the subject, subject. they're drawing from... Yeah. Like they, oh, okay. they don't they don't understand their problem. And what okay. I mean by that is is like they're trying to discover their problem by shoving paint around. And I think coders do that too and, and we almost all do that to a certain degree, right? When we're trying to discover to solve a problem, we don't really know it. And that's why we say you usually refactor three times before mm -hmm. you can really have a good solid pattern to solve your problem. So what you're doing in that refactoring is is not so much well, you're working on the solution to your problem, but what you're also doing is discovering the problem itself. You're understanding of the... it. Yeah. yeah. You're actually coming to the understanding of your problem. And and in painting, you kind of skip that step if you're well... It, it, well, not entirely. So this is similar to patterns. So the, the way that painting... If you understand principles like shapes and values and, and hue and color, uh -huh. um, if you're founded on that, that's almost like design patterns for programming. It's easier for you to take any problem and then bust out something beautiful because you understand those principles that, that you build on as an uh -huh. artist. I feel like that those building blocks in programming are programming patterns. So you can take this complex problem that most people would scumble around with for a while and you'd be like, oh, that's the observer pattern, that's with the adapter pattern, and I hook that all together and bam, we're done. Um, all right. Good programmers run into rare, rarely run into problems they haven't seen before. And then when they do, they put all their tools together to create something really magical. And I think more of a composition of all the patterns to solve the problem. So it almost sounds like there's less creativity involved in that case. Because you look at something and you see a bunch of problems that have already been solved mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of translating the problem as you see it into the solutions that you already know. Well, it's, it's not entirely. It's, I think it's even more creative because what you're doing is you're assembling in a, in a beautiful... It's almost like 
you're, you, it's, it's more creative in my opinion because every, every creation starts somewhere. Like mm -hmm. your medium that you're building something with starts somewhere. Like if you're a programmer, you're starting an operating system in a language, right? Right. And somebody did a whole lot of work for you to get to that point. Just like an artist has, someone did a whole lot of work to put this oil in the tube and made these brushes, right? There's a mm -hmm. whole lot of work gone into it, even before you start putting paint down or start writing code. Right. So we, we, have, to, we have to remember that I don't think that, that it, assembling is not creative. Assembling beautifully is one of the most creative things you can do. It's putting, that's what makes your art creative. It's like my style is the way that I put the paint on, not that I, for example, three, you get three really good artists in a room, uh -huh. and they paint the same subject. They'll have like five principles in, in common. They're great at color, great at hues, great at edges, great at values, great at, uh, uh, well, all the, I can't remember what I said, but anyways, <laughs> great at those, those distinct principles inside of art. Uh -huh. Each one of those three would have that, yet the way they applied the paint use the medium and applied it, they have all have their certain fingerprint. And so, each one would be brilliant. So you could take like two of the best programmers in the world, yes. set them down to the same problem, and they could both come up with awesome Ingenious. but different yes. solutions to that problem. Yeah, and I think I think they would have both uh, pros and cons to both. So what I would see happening is one would value speed and then maybe one would value atomicity. So, okay. so based on the artist, that's how it happens to two artists, is some value uh, edges and some value shapes. And so you'll see that, that slight nuance. And so I do believe that. And, and you would decide to pick which software you wanted based on what problem is better for your solution or what, what they did to solve your problem is better. So like if you want speed, then you go with the one. Uh -huh. If you want the, I can't remember what I said, but anyways. Yeah, so there's that's yeah, there's a lot of different um features, a lot of different needs that go into a software solution. Yeah. That, like speed is one. Mm -hmm. How often are you gonna have to touch this in the future? Yeah. Uh, how bulletproof does it need Extendability, to be? Extendability, like you'll have one 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 person could go in there and be, build the most immaculate solution to your problem, but then it's not extendable, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas one would value just extendability and and so you need, to, you need to think, do I need to extend it though, right? Right. There's certain situations where extensibility is just it's not, not needed. A, not a problem. Right. Like there's embedded systems, I don't know, there's, there's probably a couple of hundred embedded systems running on an airplane. Right. Which That's like true. Landing gear sensors or something, I don't know. There's software in there. Yeah. But its design criteria, I guess, are different from than, than like the in-flight entertainment. Probably. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think so. I hope so. Is there are there properties in common though between all of these things? Are, are there like universal principles of good code? I know we we tend to emphasize extensibility a mm -hmm. lot, mm -hmm. um, and we talk a lot about maintainability. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the code we write doesn't end up even being maintained. Like it gets, it gets rewritten right before it's maintained. Yeah. So I've sometimes thought that maybe maintainability is a is a false guiding star for yeah. for certain projects. I, I could see that. I think where what maybe what I see more of is not necessarily maintenance. It's 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 bugs. Like people, they, for some reason, maintenance is like maybe I, I guess there's two types of maintenance. There's hot fixes, bug fixes, and then there's so like adding there's features, adding features and, right? And fixing bugs. Yeah. 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 So. So what do you mean by maintenance? If you mean by bugs, I, I've seen a load of bugs go through because of bad code. Okay, so like, we could say that good code, regardless of what it's doing, leaves few places for bugs to Like hide. almost nowhere. The code that I've seen that's truly good, it's like it, there's no place for bugs to hide. They've, they understood the problem well enough that there's no hidden. There's mm -hmm. no nothing, like there's no fringe cases. Mm -hmm. And that is more rare. It's rare to see that, but there are programmers out there that can do it. So you, you could say then that, um, and maybe this is still a little subjective, but if you look at a good program, it, it should look almost exactly like the problem that it was matched for. Just yes. like when you're painting yes. a painting, the painting should look like the subject. Yeah, and you should understand it. Like for, That's another thing is good code describes what it's doing really well. right? Like If you, if you were given this problem, someone's familiar with that problem, they should be able to go into the code and follow exactly how it's being solved. Very, mm -hmm. yeah, and I would say good programs do that. 
But there's a little bit of a paradox here because a novice programmer is going to take, well, probably every programmer, okay, this is obvious, every programmer is going to take the path that makes the most sense. But the novice programmer's easiest path is going to be the imperative one. It's going to think about the problem in terms of steps that mm -hmm. need to be accomplished in mm -hmm. some order, Yeah. and then he's going to write that. Yeah. I think you could argue that that is the the easiest thing to understand, because everything is just there in one source file, even if it is 2,000 lines long. You can read it like a book and tell what's going on. So what's wrong with... Why do uh, more mature programmers tend away from imperative code towards object-oriented or um, functional or some of these others? Because the bugs. They want to remove the possibility of bugs. Just like as an artist, when they use these principles to have the least possible error. Okay. So like, you know, we simplified, for example, in art, we simplified the value scale. Mm -hmm. That means I'm not being overwhelmed with the complexity. I've broken it down into these nine values, and then I work in all the infinite values with either blending those two colors that are bridging each other, uh -huh. and then and then and even uh, they call it fanning, like just smudging the two colors together, so you create this smooth transition, which is infinite, right? Uh -huh. So like, there's ways there's ways to break down the problem beautifully, and and that's why programmers do the same thing, is they think. So so how do bugs hide in imperative code? Uh, mostly you get into the realm of the code that are at the day, for example. Um, they pass the state around in every function. Okay. So, you know, object-oriented programming, for example, the point of that is to store the state in the object and then to have very, uh, have your methods have very few parameters. The state should be inside the object and you're acting on that state and the returning results. So you know exactly where the state is. Yeah. And how the only ways it can possibly be changed. Be mutated. So you've, you've got this paradigm that helps you, right? Mm -hmm. Keep things ni nice. It's like a nice, clean room. Everything's accounted for. Mm -hmm. And I think good, good programmers, that's why it's, it's, it's somewhat harder for, uh, maybe, maybe it's because it's hard to name things well. I think, I think for novice, for even for exper experience, I'm pointing myself. That was horribly so How arrogant. do you know your experience? That's horribly arrogant. How do you arrogant. know you're any good at this? But I don't know. That's what I still wonder today. But it's even harder for experienced programmers to create good names. Uh -huh. And especially in object oriented programming, if you're doing it well, you're breaking into a lot of objects who have lots uh -huh. of different responsibilities, single responsibilities. And if they're not named well, people will not follow it. Right. Right. And so I think that's where maybe the most grind is, is, is imperatively I can follow it. But here's the thing, is I don't believe that either. If you get into 50 lines of imperative code, your brain is already gone. It's gone. Because oh, you have to load You have that to load whole the thing. whole thing in your head and go, what happened just like 20 lines above? Did we, did we check for that condition? Uh -huh. It's like, and you're you're like, you're really struggling to retain everything, all of the conditions in your head as you work down that tree. And if you've got a huge case statement, and you're 50 lines into it, I can promise you, you will have a buck because your brain cannot hold all the yeah the paths. And the case statement operates in order, so you have to know what came before. Or, yeah, and even if there's case statement, well, I see a lot of if statements and case statements. Good luck on that one. You just mm -hmm. blew through the roof. And then if that case statement's in several other methods in your class, whoa. oh man, that's when I just, I push delete. Like, it's, you know, there's, no, there's no point. Like, you may as well start there's over with the, you can't go back in there very easily and actually not create another bug. Right. Like, you will, you, will, you will almost guarantee to create another bug. Yeah. I think that's what spaghetti code means, is that if you grab one noodle... You're guaranteed to wiggle all of the other noodles. Yeah, and if they're sticky noodles, the whole thing comes out with the noodle. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. So I guess um, one of the properties of good code then is mm -hmm. the we, we've talked about breaking a problem down into individual ideas, and object-oriented programming helps with that. But the other thing you get out of that is this decoupling of the various yeah. ideas, so that yes. you can wiggle one thing and yes. not shake the whole. So, so think about that. Let's do this in a little thought experiment. Let's say you have an object, and in that object you have three or four other objects instantiated inside of it to do specific roles. So let's say this is a very complicated class. It does lots of things. Maybe something like an ORM. Really complicated. So uh -huh. inside of it there's a lot of other classes being instantiated and created to do things. Uh -huh. Because if you try to do all of an ORM in one class, you're going to have a nightmare. Uh -huh. And so if you can think about Speaking from experience. Right? It is speaking from experience. So if you had 
different parts of that ORM in classes, you could refactor that whole the whole part, like an alternator in a car, right? Uh -huh. and, and and the rest of the the rest of the thing works. Um, just because there's just this one contract this, that you have to fulfill. Yeah. And as long as you fulfill that contract, it won't break your class you're, that's using it. And and so I, I I personally see that as as that's how the it's not spaghetti anymore. You've compartmentalized. I wonder if sometimes people think they're avoiding spaghetti code because they're doing OOP. Like I have classes and instructors <laughs> and my. My internal state is all private because I'm using getters and setters, um, but they don't actually understand object-oriented programming like this. This beautiful marriage of state and functionality yes. and this encapsulation. Yeah. So in your example of the ORM, yeah, uh, that sounds nice, but it all falls apart if you accidentally leak one of those internal objects. Yes. Out of your ORM. Yes. Into somewhere else because yes. now you're free to mutate what should be internal state to the RM or something else. And that's spaghetti. That, that is, yeah, because it's, it's, inter it's it, yes, that's a perfect And you can do that example. by still using getters and setters. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And setting it, like, you can, you can do everything right. The, the compile, I guess the compiler's not going to save you from... No, spaghetti. like, that's, a, that's part of the problem with, like, functional programming or object-oriented programming is people, you, what I see mostly is, you have Java, Java developers coding in Java like C developers, like right. Like they don't even use object-oriented programming patterns, mm -hmm. and and that's just an expensive it, way to get structs. It's it's really bad, and and they pass all their state around and their functions and their methods, right? So it's like you'll see you'll see methods that have six parameters mm -hmm. that that blows me away. Like why shouldn't the whole <laughs> thing be a whole other class? With yeah. that state and acting on it. Like, yeah. I don't understand why that's there. Like, why are we using object-oriented programming if that it looks like that? We did, we did that in C because C was all we had. Right. right. And we invented it, new paradigms. Yeah. Right, right. And it was a, it was a great improvement over... And, and see, that's not... It, and what's hard is it's not entirely... You get things like JavaScript and C Sharp and even Java now where they, they're, they're mixing, they're blending the, these different paradigms together. And I still think that even in Java, sometimes imperative programming is better. Like in a game engine, uh -huh. like treating your 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 components or your entities as pure data or structs, like it's a good idea. Yeah, because you have all these different systems working on those structs. But but that's a that's on purpose. But those those other systems, they should be designed as OOP, right? Acting on the, this input. Well, then even when you're doing imperative in Java, for example, you you still set up uh, state boundaries around... You do. And what touches what, right? Right. You, you, you have that managed. Yes. And you uh, we were talking about naming earlier. One of the things that um, objects give you is makes naming things a lot easier because yeah. you, you have the, the dot and then you, you're in this new namespace and yeah. you're, you're free to start over with brand new names. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't remember what I was going with that. But... Um, I'm willing to wait. <laughs> well, we're talking about how all these languages are using imperative. Like, you oh, can yeah. do all the different types of patterns inside of a language. And I think when you understand where imperative is good and you use it well, and you understand what OOP is and you use it well, like, I love using JavaScript and using all its... It, it has prototypal inheritance, but it's behind a classical facade now. And I like that because I like prototype better. It's better mm -hmm. for storage. But I like the way classical inheritance looks, right? So, yeah. but I, I like using OOP and I like using functional programming. But I also use those differently. When the like, for example, when you're iterating over things, I like using a more functional programming. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing instead of for loops, I tend to like to do the functions um, and and like mapping and reducing and and for each. And then you can start making those the iterator function and. And bind anyways. You can do all sorts of fun stuff with that functional programming inside of an OOP environment. Yeah, that reminds me of um, another thought I had. When you're there's a lot of different styles and methods in the art world. Yeah. Um, yeah. The schools or whatever they call them. Uh huh. Um, do you think it benefits you as an artist to have studied and practiced these different styles, different paradigms about? Art, and do you find yourself drawing on multiples? Yeah, yeah. For for example, when you 
every art, because there are a lot of different art, I don't know what to call them, like, styles, right? Discipline. Discipline. I mean, discipline. Styles. But it's a lot, it's this, I think it's the same, it's like, how do you, philosophies, it's the way you solve or, or trying to communicate or, uh, communicate to the viewer, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's different ways to do that. Like, you can, you can have, like, my favorite artists do both abstract and realism in the same painting. Oh, really? Yeah, so they splash paint down, and then they'll do something super realistic coming out of that splat, uh -huh. and it's just, like, it's just magical. And my favorite part's a splat, which is, like, took two seconds, but, but it's their ability to take that, that splatter and to turn something beautiful out of it. So, but what's interesting is... I see abstract painting giving you more design, like it teaches you design, how to okay. entertain the viewer without anything that should just draw you in. Like a person that has eyes will draw anybody in, right? right? You could do a really horrible, any kindergartner could draw a picture of a human and people would be drawn into the picture uh -huh. um, just because they have eyes and are, are yeah. for some reason we're just drawn into that. So if you take all that away and the only tool you have is shapes abstract shapes to keep someone entertained it teaches you a lot now you put that together with realism and now you've got a, this really sweet um i think way to solve a problem a way to communicate something and when you're reading code can you tell when the author has uh, studied different programming paradigms like yeah because they're nicely separated <laughs> So, like, you don't see a confusion of what OOP is and what imperative is. And, like, you can see they're deliberately using that pattern. That's okay. what it is. So, uh, if you're doing a functional transform on an array of things, yeah. for instance, yes. the, the body of that function is mm -hmm. going to be real short. Yes. It's like, one or two things. Yes. And you're not going to do all this imperative nonsense yep. inside of it. Yep. And then what I see when I see the best mixture of functional programming inside of class uh, OOP is, is when you... When you say, hey, go work on this array, and you, and you, and you may just simply call it a function, it's a local state array, and then you do some churning on that, and it spits out a result. And the inside of that area that you're saying chew on this array, you're doing all the functional stuff, so it's not nicely boxed up in this yeah. method, and it looks beautiful, and then you do your functional programming. It's like almost like a sub-program in a bigger program, right? Right. And Which is all a program is. I guess I mean, subroutines, every, right? Every function, every class, every module is a sub-program. And, and so I, that's what I like seeing is when they you can see them clearly. What I don't like seeing is like lots of imperative stuff up here, and then a for then a, a functional programming here, and then and the, it's just it gets really long, and they're doing all these different things, and you could have encapsulated this into a subroutine, encapsulated this into a separate you know mm -hmm. a different method, a different method, and then you could have said do step one, do step two, do step three, and I can read that. That's true mm -hmm. object oriented programming. So you it's almost like oh object oriented programming is a good wrapper. For me, around all the okay. other patterns, it's more of an organizational pattern than a computational. Yeah, I would I would say that. Yeah, and it, and it, and if you do it correctly, then you've got you've got it nicely spelled out. You've created good class names, and and you've and you've really compartmentalized what it's doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's another question. I know you have a strong opinion on this. So I have to, <laughs> so, to be honest. I don't know if this helps answer our question okay. because it's just feeding our existing biases. Oh, perfect. But an argument that you sometimes here um, programmers use is why should I abstract this one line out into a function yeah. and uh, I know this is all going to run top to bottom yeah. why bother breaking it out into a bunch of different functions and I'm just cluttering up my source file with new lines right you made me write there. three lines when I could have wrote, written one yeah the perfect example of that one is uh, that I've seen and that I actually got into a, a discussion about <laughs> was was um we were manipulating the DOM, and we were changing the styles of a particular element on the DOM. So the DOM... Document object model. This is the internet... This is a... <laughs> we're talking about web programming. Web right? programming. So um, this is, you know, on the web page. We were uh -huh. maybe changing the background color or something on the web page. Uh -huh. And um, they wanted to change it from white to red or something. I can't remember what. It doesn't matter. But the point was they were just changing styles. Uh -huh. And it needed to do a few other things in there. Um, but I, I suggested that we pull it out and say set color to red or set background color. Uh -huh. And then inside of there was one line of code which said take the document, the, well the element that we're using, here's a style and here's red. And they're like, right. why didn't you just put that, you wrote three lines of code for that. And I thought, how do I explain this to somebody? And it comes down to 
your technology could change. So the way that you change that color, maybe uh -huh. one line today, but maybe it may be four lines today, but it could be one line tomorrow. Uh -huh. And and the point is like you're rolling up the what you're trying to do in a method. You're trying to clean you're trying to communicate to somebody what you're doing. And when I read, I think we were using jQuery at the time or something similar, I can't remember. This is a long time ago, obviously. Uh -huh. um, you would say, hey, dot CSS. Like that line of code, it didn't tell me what was happening. Hmm. It just did something. And so I have to hold, I have to read it and then go, oh, that line of code is changing the background color. And so nobody gave that to me. I have to now hold that that line 47 is changing yeah. my background color. And instead of being able to read this beautiful function that would tell me what it's doing, and I don't care about how it's doing it, just tell me what you're doing. I had to retain everything. Uh -huh. And then remember, oh, what did they do? Oh, they changed the background color, they set the text, they enlarged the font. You see all these different problems, right? Because it's easy to remember things in terms of like a story. And so if you're reading through that, you're going to translate into change the background color anyway. Like yeah. That's work that your brain has to do. Yeah. So you remember this function did this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. We talked about this in a, one of our first videos, the mm -hmm. Watt and Howe video. Yes. And recently I was reading Clean Code mm -hmm. by Uncle Bob Martin. Yes. And uh, he, he actually talked about this same thing, which made me feel really good inside. <laughs> I'm sure it did. He, Validation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he had a different name for it, but, but the idea was the same. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you want the body of a function to explain what's going on. Yeah. And then you, you describe how that happens and, elsewhere, so. and most of the, if you look at, if you do that, most of your methods don't get more than five lines. And yeah. people will be like, what? But yeah, really. If you're breaking down, and the reason why it's five lines is because there's an if statement in there. And if I could get rid of it, I would, right? Like, it gets down to that mm -hmm. that level. And, and a lot of them are actually just, remember, they have the, they're holding the state, so they can act on that state with one line, doing some other thing. But now it's labeled. It's telling us what it's doing inside that body. Right. And then if you have another, this function down here is maybe five lines and all it says is step one, step two, step three, step four, and you can read what those steps are, it informs you of the whole thing. Right. Like that one method, I can, I don't have to read all of the code to know exactly how this developer thinks. Right. And it saves, saves you, the reader of the code, from having to, to load more than you need to. And, and think finding a bug, how much easier that is. Because if you, you have a bug, someone's like, this is breaking... You the, read what it's doing, you're like... The background color got set to chartreuse. Hey. Is that even a color? I don't know. Sounds good. You should know. I just mix them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, seems like, it seems like a fertile topic for another discussion. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, so the background color got changed to the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you... It, it's simple. Like, like, if, if you're going to go look for where that happened, you... You don't need to know the hex value of the color it got set to. Right. You just find background color. Right. And you and you would find it. You would find it. Yeah. And and even if even if it was more complicated than that, like they were like, this is the part that you know how like let's say you the, your your object is simulating an engine start, like ign ignition or something, right? Uh -huh. And ignition has three steps, and you're like, the alternator doesn't turn on, right? Something like that. You would say, well, that's in step three, because you could see that step three was turn yeah, alternator turn on. on. Yeah. And so you just go to that, and not all you have to live in is that part. You're not living in that big mess. You separated it out, and so that, that's why I say you don't have bugs, is because you literally have they have nowhere to hide. Yeah. And if they do, they're found and squashed pretty easily. Yeah, I didn't used to always think about um, bugs being things that hid places, uh, but you can by by thinking oh, of them in, in 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 those terms. Of course, they hide places. It's, it's otherwise. To, uh, maybe this doesn't make any sense, but if you think in terms of um, that's a place a bug could hide, then you you tend to design things very differently. You do because remember how like if you completely understand your problem, you'll have this very straightforward solution, mm -hmm. and that's why there's no place for the bug to hide. What what I've found is is usually in these lots of if statements, lots of case statements, is they really don't understand the problem, mm -hmm. and so that's why there's hidden corners is. There's hidden use cases that they're not even comprehending. They haven't... What's that quote? It's like... Uh, you. I think you know it. it was Einstein quoted it. I can't remember. But it's something about how usually the, the solution is the simplest. Oh, Occam's Razor. The, the, 
the simplest answer tends to be the, the, the correct right one. one. Right. And yeah. that is exactly the same for the for programming. Like good programmers, like it doesn't take them a lot to do amazing things mm -hmm. because of the patterns they know. Yeah. And maybe this is there's a little paradox here too cuz um an experienced programmer sees things differently than a novice programmer. Well, it's like the tools, right? Like when when you have these tools, just like in painting, when you know values, you know yeah. color, like those are tools to you to see the world. Right. And when, you, when you're programming, you have design patterns, those are tools for you to see the world. If you're a novice, you don't have any of the tools. You yeah. literally have the language. You've been taught object-oriented programming, and that is it. Well, and been, even then, you didn't even get taught it. You've but been taught syntax. You've been taught, yeah, you've Java been taught syntax. syntax in writing in the form of C. You know what a constructor <laughs> is. Yeah. You know what getters and setters are. Right. So, I guess the hard thing is, a beginning programmer maybe just can't, can't do it. They, they, the don't, they don't have the tools. And, and I think that's part of the problem, too, where they like, don't do the design patterns because they don't... They don't even understand that, right? You're you're trying to give them code that they can comprehend. Yeah. And I don't know the I don't know the solution to this because it's it seems like we're trying to accommodate those. There needs to be an accommodation, like yeah. you, you, they work with you. Right. I just don't know what the what you. I personally just say train them. But if if, if we me. could teach the, the principles along the way, I mean, you don't start a new pianist on list. <laughs> that's right. Uh, and maybe that that's true. You you got to start from somewhere, and this isn't a slight on novice programmers by no. any means. This is like it takes work and experience, and learning and and, yeah. uh, and but see we still learn. Like I look at my code a week ago or even a three months ago, and I go, oh, yeah. like why didn't I think I did because I didn't know the problem. Usually I didn't understand the problem as as well as I thought I did, and you're disgusted with your solution. So novice or experience, it doesn't matter. You, so maybe that's the question, maybe that's the answer to our original question. How do you know that you're good is when you look at something you wrote a week ago <laughs> and see what's wrong with it. Yeah. Or Oh man, it's bad. You, you look at some other code. Of course, that's not fair to say because you'll always look at something and say, I would have done that differently. Yeah, but, yeah. But I think, we've, I think we've hit on some important things like the, the connectivity, the intertwinedness, the spaghettiness yeah. of the code. Um, state boundaries are super important. Yeah, like that, that don't goes bleed. Back to the, don't bleed the out. spaghetti thing. Mm -hmm. um, and and you can tell when when some code reflects a specific problem and not just like the the concrete steps. Yeah, to solving some problem. Right. I think. So well, well think think about. I guess another. You want to probably sum this up. Sum up. Oh, go ahead. Up. But I was just thinking of. Um, John Moses Browning, like I love his, he was building rifles and guns in the early 19th century, late 18th century, that we're still using today. Like the exact, the exact specimens? Really? Yes, like I don't think they've changed the, them. The instance the, of the gun? Yeah, the, yeah, the instance of the gun, because I mean, if you go, go look up the history about him, because it's fascinating, they would have like 30 engineers, I don't know, gun engineers, I don't know what they called them back then, mm -hmm. working on making these rifles, and they would jam, and they had all these problems, bugs, so to speak, and his philosophy was, the more moving parts you have, the more prone you are to bug, you know, to, to yeah. malfunction, so he made things work together in unity, and and so, to me, that's just like the same same thing with good programmers, yeah. is they just see the picture so differently, and they see things, how they shift together, and 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 they understand the problem well enough. And, he, go ahead. And that's a guy who really cared about his craft too. Oh, oh, he yeah. was super passionate about it. And we you've probably heard of code smells. I think craftsmanship has a nice smell. And you can tell even even yeah. down to the consistency of the spacing between methods. <laughs> yes, it is so true. And the proper grammar in um, in comments and things if you have to leave a comment. Yeah. You know, let's let's put a shout out. For example, if you want to read some good, I've read some. I don't know this. What's the date today? So people will read the code of today. But <laughs> today is the eighth of February. Okay, of two thousand nineteen. Twenty nineteen. Yeah. So uh, if you could go look, the next JS, for example. Yeah. You, if you want to see good code, go to GitHub.com/slash z z e i t. Is that right? Uh huh. 
and read anything that they write. It, it's it's you when you go in there, you feel like you're in an. It's just beautiful code. You can understand it. It's it's well. You can see the way they thought, how they broke down the problem. And they don't even use semicolons, which normally which, would drive me up the wall. It does drive me. That does just still drive me <laughs> up the wall. But the code is still beautiful, right? The way they've broken it up. Right. And and I was inspired a long time ago when V8 Engine, for example, was first being written by Lars Bach. I would I was go reading the source code because I wanted to know how he thought. Now it's a little a lot dirtier now. But back when he started it, it was so beautifully, you could see the way they were thinking mm -hmm. in their code. And I would suggest to do that. And you'll know the difference. You'll see it. And yeah. you'll be like, wow, this smells good. <laughs> it smells rosy. Yeah. So maybe there isn't a, an objective answer. I'm sure people are going to argue that there is an objective answer to what makes bad code. Right. Um, you may not be able to ever answer, is this code the best that it could possibly be? Yeah, but that's... <laughs> Oh, let's touch on that real quick. Sorry, okay. I keep extending it. We said it's really easy to see what code is worse than yours. Right. Like you can easily spot spaghetti code or, or worse code that's less maintainable, right? right. It is really hard to, to differentiate good code and great code. Like if you're not that good yet, mm -hmm. it's really hard for you to distinguish between these, uh, this good programmer's code and this, uh -huh. this extremely good programmer's code. And I don't know how... That's more of a battle for me. Like, how do you know that that good one is better than that good one? Because we're both below it. <laughs> I think it comes from learning how to see. And if, if I'm looking at code that's a little bit better than mine and way better than mine, I may not be able to see the difference. Uh -huh. I bet I could smell some things, maybe. Yeah, get maybe fills. These metaphors are getting awkward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, just, it just feels better. It just better. feels right. But what you're what you're getting with experience is the ability to see. You're like you're adding yes. a new sense. Yes. And and the way you see the world is different. Yeah. So you're more informed, right? So it's almost like you literally do get a new sense. And it's it's not just. I mean, more tools in your toolbox is is part of it. But I don't have all of the design patterns from the Gang of Four book memorized. Uh, you do. Maybe. Uh, but. I mean, it, it's something beyond that. Like this, yeah. it just looks and feels better, which again is just totally subjective. And that, that's that's the hardest part. So I so our, I, today I don't know. I, I don't know how. How do you know? I wouldn't even say it's subjective. Actually, I think there is probably some concrete measures, and people have tried with stuff like psychomatic complexity, <laughs> right? That's true, and, and things like some that. static analysis. But maybe we just don't know how to define them yet. Maybe they're just a little indefinable. I just hope I'm not delusional. You know, you go through your life, and I think the more you understand in life, the more you think I don't understand it, right? Like, yeah. you, you realize that you're, you're still not a novice, and there's a lot more to improve. Or, or maybe I'm just chasing down the wrong rabbit. I don't know. Well, that's, um, well, from our experience, I know that one of the surest ways forward is to chase the wrong rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We got hung up on observable observers yeah. for a long time. We yeah. wrote this sweet observable library yeah. that we like never use. No. Uh, but the pattern, you know, we only use it when we need to now. Right. We know where it fits. We know where it, we You do. You chase it down to its edge. We did that very end. So maybe here's, uh, here, maybe here's an answer to our question. Okay. Good code doesn't try to use just one tool. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. You you should see multiple <clears throat> paradigms yes. for the various sub problems. Yes. You should not see um, I call it hammer mode where like yeah. when you when you have a hammer everything looks like a nail. Yeah. Like you should see some uh, here's another metaphor. You should see different colors yeah. in the source code. Yes. Yeah, and and different so different solutions, different patterns are good for different needs. So if you have a a, a constraint on memory, don't use observables. Right. Not a good idea. So that's something an expert will be able to do, is see the difference between yeah. the needs. Yeah, the need, and say, well, if memory's an issue, we can't use observers, and we'll have to use more of a, a state dirty check, right? Yeah. And, and, and there's pros and cons of both of those ways. You'll, you'll see that this is a really hot part of the code that's going to get run over and over and over again. So yeah. we should... Yeah. Yeah. So you're right. That, I think that's a good... Well, there's one, one hint...
that we may disagree with tomorrow. Should be lots of different colors. Yeah, your code should be colorful. And, and used in the right way. I guess it could be colorful and awful, though, too, if you use the wrong pattern in each area, but lots of different patterns. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I haven't worked functional in here yet. <laughs> yeah. I learned about aspect-oriented programming. you got to put that in there. Put that in right there. Yeah. I'm going to make JavaScript look like Haskell. <laughs> or Java look like Haskell. Well, that would be fun. Hmm. Well, well, anyway, this has been fun. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. How are we up to 45 minutes? That's just about like average. Our ranting continues on. Yeah, well, let us know if you um, actually like this really long, but I don't know, I thought it was fun. It was fun. We yeah. recorded it. It's, it's now documented. Yeah. yeah. We'll see you later. <laughs> Bye.